much for joining us. Um, thanks for your patience too, oops, as we get started. Um, my name is Gwen Kozlowski and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, many of you know our program, but for those of you who don't, UCF is a collaborative effort between UVM Extension and the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. We provide technical, educational, and financial assistance to support communities in stewarding their tree resources. We're here today to talk about the spotted, lan spotted lanternfly. Although this insect is not yet identified in Vermont, it has great potential to impact both agricultural crops and forested landscapes. We're fortunate to have Savannah Ferreira, forest health specialist with the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, here today to speak about the biology and identification of the spotted lanternfly. Before I hand it over, I'll remind participants of a few webinar logistics. Your microphones will be muted during the presentation and there's no video option for participants. If you have questions during the webinar, please put them in the question box in the side panel and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be sent to anyone registered and will be also made available on our website tomorrow at vtcommunityforestry.org. With that, I'll hand it over to Savannah to take it away. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, like Gwen just said, today I'm going to be talking about spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive insect that's putting many forests and croplands in the United States at risk. So some background information to start us off. Spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper, which means it's a type of true bug and not a fly or a moth as its name may imply. This insect is native to China, India, and Vietnam, and was first discovered in the United States in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014, where it was believed to have arrived hitchhiking on a shipment of stones from Asia. Since then, it has been documented as an introduced invasive with the ability to travel long distances by humans. Although it now has a U.S. distribution, which I'll talk about shortly, and has not yet been observed in Vermont. So spotted lanternfly has a wide host range, and it's been reported on feeding on more than 103 plant species, which include both trees and agricultural crops. A preferred host of spotted lanternfly is Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive tree from Asia. In early studies, it was thought that Tree of Heaven was a requirement in order for spotted lanternfly to complete its life cycle. However, new research has shown us that it can successfully complete its life cycle on up to 172 hosts. Here's a picture of fourth instar nymphs, um, which I'll talk about later, um, and this is feeding on Tree of Heaven. So because Tree of Heaven is one of their preferred hosts, I just wanted to quickly remind everyone what it looks like. This is an invasive hardwood species from Asia that can be found throughout the United States, including Vermont. Um, it's a pretty hardy tree and it has the ability to thrive in poor soils and in areas with poor air quality. The bark of Tree of Heaven is smooth and brownish green when immature, but it's going to mature into a brownish gray rough bark. Um, for you fruit lovers out there, um, a lot of people think that this older bark looks like the skin of a cantaloupe, so if that helps you remember, great. Um, it has very large leaves, so this leaf up here, if you can see my mouse, that's one leaf. They're alternately arranged pinnately compound leaves. So they have the central stem or petiole, and they're going to have leaflets on each side. These leaves have a very distinctive odor when you crush them, which can be really helpful with identification. It smells a little different to everybody. To me, it smells like burnt peanut butter. Um, and once you smell it one time, it's one of those smells that definitely stick with you. Twigs are also alternately arranged, and they lack a terminal bud. If you're able to grab a twig to ID, you'll see these large V or heart-shaped leaf scars shown in this bottom left tan picture on the side. Um, if you're able to cut open the twig, you'd see a really spongy brown pith, and that's a really good ID feature. Tree of Heaven can reduce, uh, reproduce by suckering, but they're also really prolific seed producers. So their seeds are clusters of Samara, which are shown in this picture here, and they're typically wind dispersed. Female trees have the potential to produce over 300,000 seeds a year, which can persist ungerminated in the soil, which is something that we call a seed bank, uh, between two and five years. Some studies have found that in a lifespan of about 40 years, a single tree of heaven, female, can produce 10 million seeds in its lifetime, 
And in trees that have a lifespan of about 100 years, that number is going to increase to about 52 million seeds. And that's just one individual tree. So you can see how this is very highly invasive. So Penn State Extension put together this really great table showing that key plant host preference is going to change throughout the growing season, as well as with the life stages of spotted lanternfly. What's interesting is that both tree of heaven and grape, either wild or cultivated, seem to be preferred regardless of these factors. As land managers, a preference to tree of heaven is really not too concerning because it's an invasive species. But as you can imagine, this can be a huge threat to commercial vineyards and wineries. Before moving on, I just want to reiterate that Tree of Heaven is not a required host. And in fact, this study showed preference to species including rose, black walnut, butternut, willow, river birch, sumac, and silver and red maple, all of which are plant species we have here in Vermont. So now that you have a little bit more background, we can talk about its life cycle. The spotted lanternfly has one generation per year, which means it's going to hatch, mate, and die within that time frame. Here's a nice graphic summary of those life stages, but I am going to go through each one separately, but I'm just going to give you a few seconds to read this over. So first, let's talk about the egg stage. Eggs are laid between September and November, and this is the overwintering stage, so they're not going to hatch until the next spring. When they're first laid, there's a protective mud-like covering on them that helps them blend into the tree. This does tend to degrade over time, like shown in these older hatched egg masses to the left-hand side of the screen. A single egg mass typically contains somewhere between 30 and 50 eggs, um, but egg masses can have up to 80 eggs. These eggs are pretty distinct uh, because they're laid almost in perfect rows, um, and they're approximately an inch long. They like to lay their eggs where there is some coverage, like under a branch, as shown in this picture here. But eggs can be laid on a variety of surfaces. Like I mentioned earlier, spotter lanternfly was thought to have arrived to the United States on a shipment of stones. And if you look at this picture in the center where I just drew a circle around, um, you can see how hard it is and how easy it is to overlook egg masses on some of these objects. So when the eggs start to hatch in April and May, you'll start to see the first instar nymphs. These nymphs are about an eighth inch in size and are black with white spots. These nymphs are so small that they're commonly mistaken for spiders and ticks, especially if you're checking nursery stock and maybe going through the soil. Um, they can be really easily overlooked. One way to see if it's a spotted lanternfly versus a tick or a spider is to try to poke it uh, because these will hop away. Throughout the growing season, these nymphs are going to mature into second and third instar nymphs. These instars are also black with white spots, and they're going to mature between June and July. The fourth nymph instar matures between July and September, and these are red, white, and black. This final instar is typically around a half inch in size, and this is when um, these nymphs are going to become more host specific than their previous instars. According to the Berks County Extension Entomologist in Pennsylvania, this is the instar that's going to be commonly observed feeding on Tree of Heaven and Black Walnut. If you look at this picture on the bottom right, you'll be able to see that size difference between the instars. Again, we're going from a 1 8 inch, which is really small, up to a half inch, which is still pretty small. During the nymph stage, these plant hoppers are using their piercing sucking mouth parts to ingest phloem contents of the infested hosts. This stage cannot fly, um, but they are really strong jumpers and can launch themselves between and within hosts. I got a chance to work in Pennsylvania in an infested county, and I remember trying to squish them at this stage when I saw them on my oak trees, but they're so fast. You really need good coordination and quick reflexes. So the fourth instar nymphs are going to molt and turn into these really pretty adults between July and December. During this stage, uh, these adults are continuing to use their piercing sucking mouth parts to ingest phloem content of their hosts. Adult spotted lanternflies can be identified by its wings. These wings are approximately an 
inch long and when they're in the folded or tented position like shown in the left hand picture on the bottom um, they're about a half inch wide their wingspan when they're open like in the center picture is about two inches the pinkish forewings have a very distinctive pattern being half spotted and half bricked pattern their hind wings are also brightly colored red white and black which makes it pretty easy to spot in flight the abdomens of the adults are black and yellow. However, this yellow banding usually doesn't fully develop until it reaches sexual maturity. So the adult stage can fly, but they are still very quick jumpers. With high vantage points and the right wind condition, these insects are very able flyers, but they tend to lack that precise agility in flight like you see in other flying species like dragonflies. They are also very clumsy landers, um, and when you see one going in for a landing, it's more than likely always going to be a crash landing. They're kind of bulky. Um, through a combination of jumping, flying, and walking, these insects tend to move on their own about three to four miles. Adults are going to start to mate in August, and as you can see in this picture to the right, they're going to start aggregating in these large masses. Females can be found laying eggs between September and November, with a single female typically laying one egg mass, but sometimes they can lay up to two. So if you don't see any of those life stages, but you still want to monitor for spotter lanternfly activity on your land, or maybe if you're managing some crops, there's additional signs you can be looking for. Feeding from host plants are going to cause ooze or weeping, and is often um, Sorry, and it's often accompanied by honeydew secretions by the spotted lanternfly. The honeydew secretions tend to have a very strong fermented odor, um, and this tends to attract other nuisance pests, such as um, bees, wasps, and ants. So this smell is actually gonna lead to a concentrated nuisance pest activity in and around the infested hosts. So the buildup of the sticky fluid and the honeydew on the plant and maybe on the ground underneath the plants, often gets overgrown with sooty mold. And that's what you're seeing in these pictures here. Um, all of that black stuff, if you can see my pointer on the bowl of this tree, is honeydew that's covered in sooty mold. Again, it's on the bark of this picture as well, um, as well as covering the leaf. Now, although sooty mold isn't gonna kill your trees, it can kill smaller ground covers or smaller crops because once it gets to the leaves, it's essentially creating a tar mat um, where the sunlight can't penetrate the leaf and photosynthesis can't continue. So essentially your smaller crop plants and ground covers are gonna starve to death because they can't photosynthesize. Also, like I mentioned in the adult stage slide, the adults do tend to aggregate in the fall. Um, so if you do have a heavy infestation in your area, this is gonna be a common site it's not just going to be on trees, it's also going to be on outdoor furniture, stone walls, really just about anything. So now that you have some idea of what spotted lanternfly looks like and maybe some associated signs, we can start talking about where it's found. So here's the distribution of spotted lanternfly in the United States at the beginning of 2020. This map was January 10th, 2020. The blue indicates infestations of spotted lanternfly and includes Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland. The yellow indicates where spotted lanternfly has been found, but there's no infestation developed. These instances are typically single reports of dead spotted lanternflies. I'm originally from Massachusetts, so I'm going to use this as an example. In Massachusetts, there was a dead adult spotted lanternfly that was found in a poinsettia shipped from Pennsylvania. Luckily, this was an isolated observation and never became an infestation. But like I previously mentioned, spotted lanternfly started out in Berks County, Pennsylvania, which I marked on this map with a purple star. Although they are poor flyers, they're able to travel these long distances using humans as vectors. So if we fast forward this map, um, this is the most current distribution of spotted lanternfly in the United States. This was just updated last week on the 7th. Um, again, the blue indicates infestations of spotted lanternfly and includes the previously listed states, 
Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland, but now it also includes new infestations in Ohio, Connecticut, and New York. Something that's a little harder to see now is the small purple dots where spotted lanternfly was observed, but no infestation was found. These single observations included um, increased in New York, Connecticut, and Maryland. This map also leaves out New Hampshire and Maine, uh, but both states had their first in individual incidental report of spotted lanternfly, which came from a contaminated shipment of nursery stock from Pennsylvania. For both states, there's currently no evidence that an infestation has established. There were also two additional incidental observations of spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts that's also not shown on the map that happened this fall. Um, and the reason that these aren't included on the map yet is because they're not officially confirmed. But luckily for Vermont, we have still had no reports. So this is a little bit of a redundant slide, but I think it's important, which is why I wanted to share it again. On their own, spotted lanternfly are only able to move about three to four miles. And this is done through a combination of walking, jumping, and flying. Unfortunately, they are common hitchhikers at all life stages, with adults and egg masses being the most common. In highly infested areas, it can be really hard to identify some of these life stages, especially the eggs, and therefore people may not know um, that they're transporting this invasive insect. This stone shows more obvious spotted lanternfly egg masses, but to the untrained eye, this could really easily be mistaken for mud and completely ignored. Here on the bottom picture, you see a tire and wheel well of a vehicle, or maybe it's just a piece of equipment covered in fourth instar nymphs. Even if you were to go to a car wash and spray down the tires to wash off what you could see, it's possible that these are hiding in the rims. Maybe they crawled up into the engine, into these really hard to reach parts, um, and therefore they're gonna hitch a ride to the next town, or even worse, to the next state. Adults are also efficient hitchhikers, because they have arola pads and tarsal claws. These pads act like suction cups, um, much like in houseflies when you see a housefly just sticking to a wall. Um, and this allows a spotted lanternfly to hold on to moving equipment and vehicles without getting knocked off. I read some reports that a spotted lanternfly can stay on a moving car up to 30 to 35 miles an hour. So with human vectoring in mind, I just wanted to share this map created by the researchers at the US Department of Agriculture and the Shanghai Institute of Ecology and Geography in China. These researchers studied climate data in the host ranges of spotted lanternfly, and then used that data to make this model of a potential US distribution where the climate would be suitable for a spotted lanternfly. So as you can see in the United States, it's about half of the US. Luckily for Vermont, we have a very small section of red right here, um, but we seem to just have low or unsuitable habitat, um, but it's still a possibility. If we expand that model to the entire world, you can see that Europe, South America, parts of Africa and Australia all have some type of suitable habitat. We tend to focus on the United States because it's where we live and work but spotted lanternfly has the potential to be invasive in many countries. We rely on shipping and outsourcing for a lot of our goods in the US, so an invasive pest in other country is still gonna affect us. This insect has been invasive in South Korea um, since its establishment in 2006. So why is this important and why do we care? Like I mentioned earlier, Spotted lanternfly feeding can lead to oozing of infested hosts, which can attract nuisance pests and sooty molds. This oozing is plant response to this pest. The plant doesn't know what's attacking it. It's just trying to compartmentalize and seal off the damages in a cookie cutter response. This response and oozing uses a lot of energy and stress, um, which really stresses out the host, which can contribute to wilting and even die back in both your crops and your heavily infested trees. Due to the reduced uh, photosynthates and energy, less energy is going towards fruit production, which is gonna cause yield loss or maybe a reduction in the quality of, of fruit or crop 
that you are getting. Um, because again, the energy is not going towards reproduction. It's trying to go um, to compartmentalization. So as you can imagine, this is all very stressful to the host plant. Stress can predispose it to other insects and pathogens. Some studies have actually shown that this stress can even reduce cold hardiness of hosts, um, which is a problem in our northern New England states like Vermont, um, because as many of you know, we have these very long and cold winters. So to look at the economic impact this can have, let's look at Pennsylvania alone, um, just because it was ground zero for the U.S. infestation. A study by economists in Penn State's College of Agricultural Sciences showed that currently Pennsylvania has lost $50.1 million a year and almost 500 jobs since its infestation started in 2014. They predict that the state will lose somewhere between $324 and $554 million a year, in addition to almost 3,000 to 5,000 lost jobs. This lost revenue comes from affected commodities, including but not limited to hardwood forest products, grape vineyards, apple orchards, and nursery and landscape industries. In addition to destroying agricultural crops and damaging trees, this is also a really big nuisance pest. In heavy infestations, they can cover all outdoor surfaces, which cause people to want to spend less time and maybe less money enjoying the outdoors. So I do promise that this presentation is not all bad news. Um, there are several control efforts that are being conducted to try to slow and stop its spread. So the first thing that we should be doing, excuse me, is trying our best to prevent spotted lanternfly from coming into the state in the first place. For this to be successful, early detection is very important. If you can identify egg masses and the other life stages, removing and killing them can slow population growth and spread. For example, if you're in an area with a known infestation, or maybe you're traveling through an area with an infestation, take the time to look for potential vector sources. This table might be a little blurry on your screen, but New York State put together a checklist of high priority vector points that should be routinely inspected. If you can't read, some of these include uh, motorhomes, recreational vehicles, trailers, tarps, and firewood. There are also some examples of commonly used recreational and camping gear, outdoor items, and building materials. Some states that have quarantines may issue permits that require you to complete a checklist and inspection of these common vector points before leaving that quarantine. Um, here's just an example showing the quarantine areas as of January 2020. Um, if you're traveling in any state with an infestation, you should really go on to their state website and double check what quarantines are in place and what laws you need to abide by. So if you think that you found spotted lanternfly in Vermont, please visit VT Invasives and report the sighting. Um, if you're listening today from outside of Vermont, every state is gonna have some type of invasive reporting website or contact person. Uh, VT Invasives is just what we use here. I know I speak for all state representatives that even if you're unsure, still please report the sighting. We'd much rather take the time to look at something that isn't spotted lanternfly or maybe another invasive, um, then risk someone actually seeing it and not reporting it. Because without that report, we're not gonna know, we might take a couple more months to realize that it's in the state. Um, and we're gonna have a delayed response time, which can delay or maybe stop control and eradication. So if you visit our spotter lanternfly page on VT Invasives, you can also familiar, familiarize yourself with some lookalikes that we have in the state of Vermont. Some examples include the harness tiger moth, box elder bugs, and gypsy moth. So outside of education and prevention, sticky bands are another control method um, that's pretty popular, um, used by homeowners mostly. Spotted lanternfly nymphs and adults both instinctively travel up the tree. So this is a really cheap and effective way to catch them in urban settings. The behavior of why they travel up the tree is still being researched, but they could be doing this possibly to feed on the thinner barked areas of trees or use it as a launching post to hitch a ride in the wind. When you are applying sticky bands or any kind of um, 
sticky band or sometimes there are also tarps um, to trap pests, you should also always cover it in chicken wire um, because you don't want birds and small mammals getting stuck in there and dying. So if you're squeamish, please look away. Here's a bird that got stuck on a spotted lanternfly trap. I just wanted to show this image because it does happen a lot. Uh, spending the extra three to five dollars for an entire roll of chicken wire at your local hardwood store um, is a really cheap and easy preventative measure that you can take. Okay, the picture's gone. <laughs> so circle or funnel traps are another method that's becoming more popular um, because this is going to be safer for those non-target animals. Here you take nylon or some type of very fine mesh wire and you either wrap a section of the tree or you go the entire width of the tree and create a funnel where the spotted lanternfly is gonna get channel channeled into a bag or another type of container. And as you can see in this left-hand picture, all of those black dots are nymphs of spotted lanternfly. So if a population is already pretty established, um, trap trees are another tool that's used. For this method, um, if you're looking in more of a forested setting, you would remove most of the tree of heavens in the area and only leave a few. Um, it is preferred that you remove uh, the females so you don't add to the invasive seed banks, uh, but remove most of them in the area and treat them so they don't re-sprout. If you're in an urban setting, this can also be used on any other type of tree that you're trying to save. But regardless, a few trees that are standing is going to get treated with a systemic insecticide during the growing season. You're going to have to refer to your own pesticide labels for the time of year, uh, but here we're just two listed by Penn State Extension. The idea behind this is that as a spotted lanternfly will feed on the phloem, and this feeding happens in any stage besides the eggs, um, they're going to ingest these pesticides and die hopefully before mating and laying eggs in the fall. The picture to the right shows a snapshot from a webinar that Brian Walsh gave, um, and he's the Berks County Extension entomologist. Um, here are legitimate piles of dead spotted lanternfly beneath a treated tree. Um, now, again, this is not tree of heaven. You can treat any tree that you wanted to use as a trap tree, um, but as you can see, it is pretty effective. So removing the preferred host of tree of heaven may possibly deter spotted lanternfly from establishing. However, several studies have confirmed that their life cycle can continue with a non-Atlantis species. But Tree of Heaven is invasive anyway, so getting rid of it in Vermont is going to be beneficial to our environment regardless. So there's several ways you can remove this tree. The first, you can pull out seedlings. Maybe if you have a couple in your backyard, um, this is a really cost-effective management tool in urban settings when you only have a couple. Um, if you do choose this method, make sure that you get the entire root system because these trees will persist and sucker. Another method is cutting down and applying herbicide. Again, you need to make sure that these cut stumps get treated because they will keep re-sprouting. A potential eradication effort that I'm most excited about is using the native fungus Verticillium non-alfalfae as a fungal biocontrol. This strain of verticillium is native to several regions in the Eastern United States, and it's actually host specific to Tree of Heaven. If you look at this picture to the left, the dead trees in the middle of the stand were actually Tree of Heaven killed by this vascular pathogen in a research setting. Uh, the rest of the panel shows up close symptoms of this pathogen. So panel B shows acute will and defoliation, Panel C shows epicormic sprouts that have emerged following stem dieback, but again have started to wilt and die. Um, and then panel D shows vascular discoloration and streaking. For those of you unfamiliar, this is a vascular pathogen. Um, so this discoloration is actually dead and dying vascular tissue. So before moving on, I just want to reiterate that in states where spotted lanternfly is already established, Removing Tree of Heaven is not always going to be a cost-effective um, management strategy, and it's not going to eliminate spotted lanternfly. Tree of Heaven is important because it is a preferred host, which is why I've talked about it today, um, but again, it's not necessary for survival. 
So in their native range, spotted and lanternfly has natural enemy enemies, sorry, um, that keep their populations in check. One is an egg parasitoid, Anastasis orientalis. Um, this has been reported to parasitize about 30% of egg masses. And within those egg masses, they can parasitize up to 40% of the eggs. Another wasp is a nymph parasitoid, Dryinus browni. In China, this has been reported to parasitize somewhere between uh, 40 and 50% of second and third instar nymphs. Currently, both of these parasitic wasps are going under um, testing with APHIS in several US states. I think Delaware has been doing most of the research, um, but they're just trying to test their host specificity before we can consider releasing them in the United States. Interestingly, uh, Penn State Extension actually has observed a gypsy moth parasitoid parasitizing spotted lanternfly eggs. Currently, parasitism is really low. It's only about 7% of egg masses, um, but it is still pretty cool. This picture is showing that gypsy moth parasitoid on top of an adult spotted lanternfly, uh, which is a weird picture because this is not how they parasitize the eggs, but it is cool that they got a snapshot of it. Um, I do want to mention that spotted lanternfly can also get eaten by birds, praying mantis, spiders, assassin bugs, but this is very sparse um, and it's never going to be in quantities large enough to curb their population. So fungal uh, pathogens have also started to be researched for their use as biocontrol agents. Although research is still in its very early stages, Cornell has found that strains of Buvaria um, attack both nymphs and adults, as well as Antomophaga species attacking adults. Um, for some background information on biocontrols, the genus Buvaria can attack many species of insects. Um, it's not very host specific, so it makes a lot of sense why it can do the nymph stage and the adult stage. However, your Antomophaga species are typically very host specific. Um, so releasing this as a pathogen, uh, as a fungal biocontrol uh, would be less harmful than doing something that's not as host specific. But these biocontrols are still being cultured and observed in a lab setting, um, and they haven't been released yet in the United States on purpose. So before ending today, I just wanna share some more resource, resources with you. Um, this is relatively a new pest. So information is being added, updated, and corrected all the time. If anyone has questions or maybe some information that they felt that I left out that they want to discuss, I'm going to have plenty of time to answer questions and have these discussions. And with that, here's my contact information. Please feel free to email, call, text um, if you have any forest health issues or concerns. Um, if you think that you have spotted lanternfly or maybe you saw it or another invasive, you can also use the VT invasive report it function and that will eventually come to me as well. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Savannah. And I'd like to just reiterate, we appreciate uh, report it's even if they are not of the suspect species. Um, as if many of you joined us earlier, we were chatting about um, when murder hornets were in the news and we got many reports on European hornets, but actually helped us um, try in, in an informal way map that um, species as well, which was some, a side benefit. So we really appreciate reports, even if it, uh, you're not sure of what it is. Uh, we're happy to help you identify that. Um, so please take your time to answer or type in some questions. Um, we did just have a comment from Gary Fish so far, who is in Maine. They haven't found, um, they've only found empty egg masses there. No nymphs or adults have been found. Um, but they did find an, a dead adult in a shipment of ornamental hay bales for Halloween, which seems like that was a, a good observation to be able to find that on a hay bale. Yeah. Um, Looks like we've got a question from Michael. Is it safe for human foragers to eat the spotted lanternfly? Um, I would not recommend it. Um, I've read some studies, and again, information's changing all the time, that some of the secretions from the um, tree of heaven in particular are really bitter. And actually some animals don't wanna eat spotted lanternfly because they taste bad. Um, I've also seen some non-official studies of dogs eating spotted lanternflies 
um, when you have those heavy infestations and having to go to the vet um, and just throwing up a lot. So I would not recommend it. Great. Uh, should we be looking for egg masses on poinsettias and or Christmas trees? Yeah, absolutely. Um, checking anything that's coming in from nurseries. Um, again, we're humans and humans make mistakes. Uh, there are checkpoints involved before you can ship anything through commercial nurseries, um, but sometimes things get overlooked. So if you have a poinsettia at home, uh, definitely take off the wrapping, that pretty red foil, just check in there. Um, it's always good to be on the lookout. Great. Is there any identification uh, that spotter and lanternflies themselves might be a vector for the Versilium pathogen between Tree of Heaven individuals? Um, I don't think so. Um, the way that spotter and lanternfly only has that short time frame of one year, um, I don't think it's a very efficient vector. Um, that's not saying it's not impossible, um, but I don't think research has been conducted on that just because they have such a short time frame to live. Great, thank you. Uh, this is from Sabina. I read about some research being done at the vet school at Penn State using dogs to ID egg masses. Any updates on this? I have no updates, but um, dogs have been used for a lot of forest health things. There's dogs that can sniff out um, oak wilt pathogen, which is another invasive species that we're always on the lookout. So it's not surprising and it is really exciting. Another excuse to have a dog, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wish I could train my guy to do that. Um, is spotted lanternfly known, uh, a known vector to any pathogens? Can it be a vector uh, for thousand cankers disease uh, to black walnut? Um, so research is still in its really early stages with spotted lanternfly. I don't think I've read anything that's published yet on what it can vector. Um, but again, it is a possibility. Anything that's feeding on a tree that's infected with a fungal disease, anything has the ability to vector something. It just may not be efficient or the prime reason behind it moving. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like in Addison County uh, that poses the biggest potential for infestation. Is this true? So that was just one model showing suitable habitat. Um, again, with climate change, we could see that this model gets updated next year and maybe we have more suitable habitat. Um, because it doesn't need Tree of Heaven to complete its life cycle, it does have the possibility to be established anywhere. Um, in Vermont, we're hoping that some of our cold temperatures are going to kind of keep populations in check if we do end up getting an infestation, um, but new research is being uncovered all the time. And I think it's going to be more of a temperature um, issue moving forward. Following up on that, we have a question from Chris. What makes an area unsuitable for spotted lanternfly? Is it only species or lack of species? But it sounds so, like it might be temperature dependent as well. I think it's going to be more temperature dependent. Again, spotted lanternfly can feed on anything with phloem almost. So it's over 103 reported species. Um, so once it gets established in the area, it's not really a problem finding a food resource. Um, but again, making sure that it doesn't, um, if it's, sorry, it's going to overwinter as egg masses. So if our temperatures maybe get low enough where they could get killed by overwintering, we're not really sure yet. Um, research is still in its early stages and because it's right now established in those warmer climates, that's what we're going to be on a lookout for. Um, with the new New York infestations, I think we're going to learn a lot from New York and we need to really pay attention uh, because our climates are a little bit more similar than, say, Pennsylvania. Um, so this is all new things that are hopefully going to be answered soon, but just not right now. Great. I think there's a few actual questions in here about cold tolerance. So we don't know the temperature or for how long that needs to be out. So the question, the jury's still out on that. Yes. Uh, should we avoid mail orders from plants sold from Pennsylvania nurseries? Um, again, if you're buying stuff through certified nurseries, there are precautions in check. Um, I would probably not buy stuff off of the internet. I know Etsy sells a lot of plants. Anybody could sell plants on sites like Etsy, Facebook Marketplace. I would definitely avoid those because not only spotted lanternfly, but a lot of other pests and pathogens can be transported that way. And that's pretty unregulated. Um, but buying through commercial nursery is generally a safe bet, but it's still always good to just double check. Yeah, like the example of emerald ash borer um, in Maine, they had to track down um, 
was it 30 different plants that uh, mm -hmm. had emerald ash borer that had been shipped up from Pennsylvania. So um, yeah, buying is, was always best, but we, we can't always do that. Exactly. Uh, if you encounter egg masses, should you wait to destroy them? Contact a specialist first. What do you suggest? Um, I would definitely report it first, take some pictures of it, um, but definitely squish and kill them. You can scrape them off a tree and put them into alcohol, or because if you don't have ethanol, um, some of your higher proof like vodkas um, will kill that. Um, and you can keep it in that container and also give it to a state specialist, so then you don't risk having a delay. Um, but yeah, always try to kill it, but take a picture if you can. Great. Uh, is there any outreach to stone yards to have them be on the lookout for egg masses? So right now, uh, us as a state are really early in our response to what we want to do with spotted lanternfly. Um, the Agency of Agriculture put out a really great mailing recently with different stages of spotted lanternfly and what to look for. Um, so we're trying to have these webinars and include them in newsletters uh, just to get the word out there so everybody can start looking. Great. Uh, we'll take another 10 or 15 seconds uh, to see if anyone has any last follow-up questions. But Savannah, I just want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, it, as we've got a, a bunch of different um, a variety of people on here, it just speaks to the, the need for this information. Um, looks like there's a question from Chris. Is as 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 Dreiken, uh, can you uh, do you see the questions? I can't say it. A Z A. Okay. Um, is is that a possibility? Is I'm not sure what that is. Is, is, you, is that a pesticide? I'm not sure. Chris, do you want to type in if it's a pesticide? I don't have the chat on my screen. Okay. It's A Z. Well, I can follow up with you afterwards. Okay. Um, oh, it is a pesticide. Yes. So I can follow up with you offline too. Okay, sure um, <laughs> so I, I recently um, watched a webinar on spotted lanternfly by the Berks County Extension entomologist, Brian Welsh, and he mentioned that uh, he's been working on spotted lanternfly since it's basically started because it was in Berks County, Pennsylvania, um, that spotted lanternflies are actually really easy to kill. So it, it seems like there's a lot of pesticides and systemic pesticides that can be used. Um, and sometimes even just like transporting them to the lab they would just kill a bunch accidentally because it was harder to keep them alive like in captivity um, than they really thought. So I do think we'll be able to see a lot of different things that we could use chemically against them. Great. Okay. Um, I think that's it for questions so far. But again, thank you, Savannah. If you have anyone else has follow up questions, please feel free to email me or Savannah and I'll get them to her. Um, but thank you so much. We got some great questions. Uh, comments in the, the chat box as well for such a thorough presentation. Thanks, Savannah. Um, well, we hope you all have a good rest of your day, and I'll send out the recording as soon as we have it available. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye now.